what if you like went into your job and you did absolutely nothing, but you actually got paid? So like this story is diving into one such case of a guy that was paid to do absolutely nothing, just sit on his butt. Maybe he's reading Reddit stories. Is this about me? No, I'm just kidding. I love, I love my job. This is my first solo episode without John. I miss him already. So say, John, I miss you in the comments if you also miss John. So we're going to talk about what happens when you achieve the American dream. Getting to do nothing and still making bank. An epiphany was had this morning as I peruse Reddit, sipping code red, and toying with the notion of stepping outside for my third cigarette in an hour. Oh, a cigarette. Smoking. Nine years and two months of my life have been devoted towards the goal of personal advancement within a small, yet thriving company. I arrived one spring morning at the offices of a local company, just a 15-year-old acne-encrusted, bespeckled face in the crowd with a dot matrix printed resume extolling my massive abilities with the 386 computer and willingness to work after school. I was immediately hired at minimum wage and began a series of menial jobs within said company, including authorizing credit cards and serving as a squeaky voice telephone operator. Great first job. I mean, one of my first jobs at Nike, actually, in Australia, selling shoes. It was awesome. Love that first job. Can look at someone's foot and know their size. I don't, I don't know why I'm winking. At 16, I graduated from high school and moved off to the wonderful world of college. Yet for the sole reason of tuition reimbursement, I continued with the same company, continuing to bounce around from department to department, serving as a van driver, a shipping and receiving inspector, an MIS administrator. I never stayed in one place for very long. And it was during this time period, the wonderfully blurry undergraduate years that I unknowingly sowed the seeds of my current employment bliss. The groundwork was laid. Some exciting foreshadowing happening right now. Come graduate school, my contributions to said company began to become clear to some in positions of power. I was transferred for the 11th time in six years, this time to a place of some responsibility for the everyday running of the company. Man's moving up in the world, becoming the head honcho. By day, I struggled to comprehend super string theory, laboring under the false assumption that a master's degree in physics would bring exciting things for me. By night, I climbed the corporate ladder, supervision ship, management, power. Man's gonna freaking become Jeff Bezos in no time. I had it all at the age of 21, a brand new piece of paper designating me a master in physical sciences and a management position in a strong company. A score of people twice my age reporting to me. Man, has minions that are like mid-40s with receding hairlines. It's pretty sick. I worked 70 hours a week, but I believe that I had achieved in a short amount of time what it had taken my father 50 years to attain. Good on you, OP. Good on you. Then came September 11th. As the Twin Towers fell, the economy fell with it. Damn, that sucks. You know what doesn't suck though is September 11th flight deals. We we flew on September 11th and we got like 25% off. Faced with massive layoffs, my company was forced to cut my entire department and leave all responsibilities solely in my hands. I was a manager with no employees, a general without an army. <laughs> no more balding uh, people to do your bidding, bro. No, no more bald bidders. I, I associate like office work with shiny heads, but... I just, I just do. Yet, I still toiled long and hard, <laughs> long and hard. It continued this way for three months. I never slept. I spent every waking minute at the office, yet convinced myself this was still the greatest thing going. The American dream. Dude, Americans just love to work themselves to death. How is, why is that the American dream? That it's just like, I am going to work until I die. And then my children will get to work until they die. And then their grandchildren will do the same forever and ever. How is that? American dream. I think there should be more doing nothing. One day in a morning coffee and donuts meeting, a vice president suggested the possibility of moving myself and my responsibilities out of the corporate offices to a satellite facility some a thousand miles away. Dude, your vice president is trying to get rid of you. It's like, hey, uh, you're doing a great job here, but like you smell so bad and I would love it if you just did your work a thousand miles away. I would love 
love it if you just did your work so I didn't have to look at your non-shiny head. Because really, when I look at someone's head, I want to look at myself, and you're not bald enough for me to do that. <laughs> Vice presidents with their ego, bro. A thousand miles away. That's so mean. Anyway, seeing this as an opportunity for advancement, I jump. I arrive, acquired a large office in a remote corner of said facility, and continued with my march towards greatness. Freaking the, the Caesar of of boring office jobs. Et tu brute, vice president stabbed me in the back by putting me a thousand miles away. But maybe this is maybe this is a good thing. So then something strange and wonderful happened. In Outlook, an email appeared with my name in the courtesy copy field. Apparently, a new vice president had decided to delegate the responsibilities that once were mine to another department, which is not good because that means that you are no longer needed. That means your job is completely superfluous. It's just not needed. Your job is eliminated. You're about to be fired. Ah, okay, as OP says too. Immediately frightened for my job and my well-being, I was tempted to scream out. Yet, thankfully, I remained silent like a little lamb silently waiting on top of the hill ready to be sheared. I don't know why I'm talking about lamb, but for... Anyway, I continued to come into the office on time every day, picked up the random pieces of my old job that were left scattered in the transition and waited for the word. That, my friends, was four months ago to the day. After 30 days, I became convinced that I was a forgotten, non-digestible entity in the corporate stomach. <laughs> wow, what a what a metaphor, man. This is the, the piece of gum that just stuck to the lower intestine of Big Daddy Warbucks, never to be flushed down the toilet of corporate efficiency. No man ever comes over to ask for anything. Although I am but a manager and directors roam the hallways like rabid hyenas, I am much too senior to all of them for them to attempt an attack. Every once in a while, the phone will ring. An old acquaintance will ask for help solving a problem, and I gladly comply. Sometimes I let the phone ring, but the voicemail light never comes on. They move on to the next target under the false assumption that I am much too busy to be bothered. OP is freaking matrixing about, like freaking dodging bullets left and right. Like, oh, like, can you do this task? Oh, oh can you like sign this mo? I start coming in later, wearing blue jeans on Monday. The gall. Testing my limits. I take 25 cigarette breaks a day. OP, you gotta, that's a pack a day. You gotta, you gotta slow down. Come back into my air conditioned office, dim the lights and browse the internet in a half comatose state until I determine that it's time to pack up for the day. Old copies of Baseball Weekly adorn the mahogany desk. The reams of paper lie in and around the unattended trash bin, each covered with random drawings of stick figures and jet fighters. This is like, just like the bored kid in school. I don't know if you ever did this, but like I would draw like the S's in school and like that was my big doodle or, or well, let's be real. It was more than S's. I often roam the hallways with a piece of paper and a mug of coffee, exchanging pleasantries and talking about the weather and equally mindless topics with my coworkers. I go to meetings and other managers gaze with reverence at my presence. I'm never invited, but to those who know not what I do, I am respected and welcome, which is like the ultimate sign of respect. Like, I have no idea what that guy does, but like, damn, let's give him a little nod. Doing great work, Bill. Doing great work, OP. What are you working on? <laughs> it would take too long to explain. As in, I have a lot of Reddit to read right now, and I don't want to explain it to you. It hit me this morning that perhaps all of my endless toil and hard work has landed me here. I've transferred so much within the company that all my paperwork has long since misplaced. I exist only in a computer program that spits out a four digit paycheck to my bank account every other Thursday. Just another tick on the underbelly of the corporate war dog. <laughs> What's with all these animal references? Too senior to be fired, too misunderstood to be bothered. I am truly the forgotten employee. And so, my Reddit friends, I am quite open to suggestions about how I may truly test the boundaries of my newly discovered freedom. A webcam lays in its box underneath my desk, awaiting my motivation to install it. No suggestion is outside the boundary of reason or consideration, for I have found my holy grail. I have achieved the American dream. And there is a part two to this, but like, what should OP do? My first thing is like, okay, if you're trying to test the limits, try to go on a vacation. Like, ditch the office. Go remote, bro. Like, 
turn on that webcam and 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 like get this gr like a green screen and say like oh no i'm at the office just like i would i would try to to move around a little bit because then if you could get still get the paycheck and not have to show in at all then that's the true american dream I, my question to you though is if you hit this kind of jackpot do you tempt fate by trying to be a little bold and see if you can like not show up to the office that is my question to you. Put your answers in the comments and say, I choose to tempt fate if you would try to push things a little bit or say, I am a safe Sally if you would not and just like keep taking the check. But uh, let's get into part two of this story. All that I have worked for over the past five months of not working nearly came to a horrible death this past Friday. It's because you tried to tempt fate. Those fate tempters, you know, they're, they're, you're rocking the boat and you're just going to get tossed away you're going to drown at sea. You're going to get eaten by a sea monster. You're going to meet Nessie, go on a date, and then get catfish, dragged by that catfish into the depths of the sea and buried under the mud. Uh, and that's not what you want. I arrived at the office at 1030, still dressed in the wrinkled khaki pants from my very lengthy Thursday night at the bar. I sneaked into the side door and made a beeline for my office. On the way, I was stopped by an electrician who informed me that they were working on the air conditioning in the office building and that some sections of the sprawling complex would be without electricity during different parts of the day. He reassured me that if I was indeed in an occupied area of the building, that I would be informed in plenty of time. Of course, since nobody knows I exist, I expected to be left in the darkness at some point during the day. The guy's not even going to come out of his office when it's completely dark and the lights are turned off and the energy is no more man is just gonna silently browse reddit and not try to rock the boats except maybe the boat will be rocked i eased into my office shut the door and sat down at my desk my morning regimen consists of checking baseball scores a quick once over of reddit and then off to randomly scour the network drive for excel documents i will pull up at least five spreadsheets ranging from actual important price sheets to recent company softball scores, it doesn't matter as long as it's an Excel document. Is it that is that is it that easy to like just trick people that you are working on something? Does no one ever, I guess, yeah, you explained he's too senior to be checked on, but things that easy. I print them out, then walk to the other side of the office building to copy them. Somehow, in my mind, this makes it look like I'm working and looks are the most important thing. That is so true of corporate America. Like when I worked in in for or like around corporate people it's all appearances and it's this giant like finger blaming and finger pointing game of like oh no no, no i didn't up that guy up. it's just i hate it i hate it it's so false like like no one will say anything to your face it's like it's, it's like oh like i'm sorry that you misunderstood which means just like i'm sorry that you're a idiot and can't understand something simple anyway on my way to the copy machine i was stopped by a fellow manager one who actually works which i assume is most of the people at this company he reminded me reminded of a 11 o'clock meeting in the conference room and i played dumb i guess like only way to play it right if you have no idea what's going on oh uh, you had to have gotten the email it was sent to all the managers he replied not knowing that I was the forgotten employee, the employee that never works of Company X. I tried to wiggle my way out of it, but I was stuck. Begrudgingly, I made my way into the brightly lit conference room, thinking that it couldn't be that bad. After all, it was Friday, there would probably be Krispy Kreme donuts, and I could just easily sit there and not say a word. Uh, but I was very, very wrong. First rule of, I guess, being the forgotten employee is don't be memorable at all. And don't go to any meetings. Bad sign number one. Nowhere in the room was there the distinct aroma of honey glaze goodness. Even the coffee pot was ominously switched off. This is a horribly bad sign in the corporate world. Lack of food means that the meeting will be about business related issues. What what meetings are people having? Wait, anyone that works in corporate, what are the other meetings beside business related issues that people are having? Because is that not isn't that the point of meetings? Bad side number 2. The normal large conference table is nowhere to be found. In its place is a U-shaped formation of folding tables. U-shaped formation 
equals audience participation equals horribly, horribly bad. I hope OP is like coming up with some story of like what he's been doing for the past six months. I've been working on this Excel spreadsheet um, and also uh, making sure morale is high by uh, choosing the the softball team for, for the company kickoff next quarter. What do you even say? And how do you prove it if they follow up? This is code red right now. Bad sign number three. I reflexively reached over by the door for the inevitable handout and felt nothing. No handout equals note taking is mandatory. I begin to have a very sinking feeling about this meeting. Bad sign number four, standing in front of the stained dry erase board was the nemesis of all forgotten employees, the director of people's services, AKA human resources Nazi. I was a Warsaw Jew face to face with Himmler. Okay, OP, uh, are we taking this a little bit far? But then again, OP's fake livelihood is on the line, so. She glanced at me as I quickly averted my stare, but I thought that I may have caught a glimmer of recognition in her eyes. Recognition is the enemy of the forgotten employee. Remember that. And that, my friends, scared the hell out of me. The beer sweat started rolling off my forehead as I ran through my options. I was about 15 feet inside the doorway, and she had seen me. Quick flight was out of the question. I was forced to sit through this meeting and try to keep my cover. Looking at the U-shaped formation of tables, I decided to sit directly in the middle, contending that if any type of let's go around the room shit went on, she would undoubtedly start from one of the ends of the room. I took my company cell phone off and set it on the table, then proceeded to sit and wait. Also, OP is playing some like 4D chess right now. Like the fact that OP thought to sit in the middle is, is genius. There's a lot of work that goes into not working. There, 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 this, this is not easy. No, I don't think anyone could just pull this off. So, uh, but take notes, take notes. Unfortunately, the meeting turned into my worst nightmare. Buzzwords started keying off alarms in my head as they flowed from the mouth of the hideous HR gargoyle. Teamwork, employee insight, departmental budgets, etc. The meeting was a quarterly employee idea meeting where managers would gather and share what work their teams had accomplished and what they were looking forward to. And considering my team had been effing contracted on September 11th and I was currently a free agent with no intention of signing with anybody, I was worried. And then it happened. Let's go around the room and say what the general view among your reporting employees is to the future of Company X. Sh I knew I was f and I needed to get out. My heart skipped a beat as the first ass kisser on the end started babbling away about how great his employees are and started calling them off by name. I needed a fire alarm, a stroke, or a meteor strike, and it needed to be soon. OP is asking for the most. A meteor strike? You want to have something that made the dinosaurs go extinct to make this meeting go extinct. You want to go that far? But maybe that's what's needed. Before I was forced to open my mouth and out myself as a non-working leech to the rest of the world, my eyes searched the room for something to help me out. The fire alarm was too far away, as was the window. The light switch was directly behind me, but was only as a last resort. I had almost given up hope when my eyes situated on the table in front of me, my cell phone. I needed a phone call and I needed it as soon as possible. Telekinesis failed me for a good two minutes as it came closer and closer to being my turn. Then I realized something amazing. I was wearing my bar pants. The beauty of my bar pants is that they have amazingly deep pockets. Is that fashion? It sounds like cargo pants. It sounds like cargo pants and cargo pants are the enemy of fashion. Prove me wrong in the comments if you think not. I also feel like Pockets are generally the en enemy of fashion. Like utility is the enemy of fashion. That's why all of the, you know, like, like all of my girlfriends that have like, you know, like cute little dresses or pants, no, not, no functional pockets. And it looks great because there are no pockets. And nestled down past the crumpled up $1 bills, the napkins, the receipts, and the Bud Light bottle caps was my saving grace. My wife's cell phone. Why do you have your wife's cell phone? And listed under the letter A, in her pre-programmed numbers was my work cell phone. 
A rush of excitement filled me and my hand started slowly inching towards my pocket. Because of the angle of my leg, I couldn't reach into my pants without drawing unwanted attention. Sounds like you're about to start math. Uh, <laughs> so I had to make a go for it from the outside. Still sounds like you're masturbating. It was only two clicks, one on the down button in the middle to highlight my number and the other on the send button. But timing was crucial. As it came closer to my time to speak, I felt the outline of the phone, my fingers skimming the display screen and pushed down once on the scroll button, then mashed to the left to send the call. I believe victory was mine. But unfortunately, the phone on the desk remained silent. Also, I guess this is this this uh, this story is a, a, a little ways away from the present because uh, he ain't on a touch screen. I believed 10 seconds passed, 20 seconds, and yet nothing happened. I had obviously highlighted the wrong name to call. It struck me as mildly humorous that somewhere, one of my wife's friends was answering a call from her cell phone, blissfully unaware of my epic struggle to free myself from the meeting from hell. As soon as it was obvious that I had dialed the wrong number, I moved my thumb back to the right and punched the end button approximately 10 times hoping to cancel everything out. The train of talking had reached the person sitting next to me and the focus of the room was in my general direction. I probably only had one chance to pull it off. And I had to do it discreetly. Again, if you're like messing with stuff in your pocket, it's gonna like that, that, that looks really, that looks really sketchy. So uh, I wish you the best OP. <laughs> you try to call discreetly. With my body turned towards the speaker, my hand creeped down once more. I coughed slightly as a distraction while my fingers made a ninja flick across the scroll and send keys. Then I moved my hands to the table and waited. Five seconds, 10 seconds went by. The person next to me was finishing up. It was almost my turn. I thought I was completely done for, and then it happened. The cell phone lit up and the telltale Nokia tone started resonating through the room. Opie has done it. All eyes shot to me as I tried my hardest to contain my elation. I grabbed my phone and pushed the answer button. Ben, I said authoritatively. My voice echoed through the speaker as the cell phone in my pocket picked up the background noise. Oh, yes, sir, Mr. Name of the Company Vice President of the Corporate Office. I have the information at my desk. Can it wait? Oh, I understand. Okay, wait, so Ophi just faked a call from his boss. I then covered up the phone and said to the HR Nazi, do you mind? She was taken aback, but smiled and nodded. It was all the break I needed. I sprung out of the chair and headed for the door, pretending like I was talking, nodding absentmindedly to myself, engaged in a pretend conversation with my pants. I was temporarily free. I hurried back to my office, closed the door, and waited. The time was 12 noon, and I was sure that soon the HR Nazi would show her face and ask to sit down and chat about what I had missed at the meeting. I browsed Reddit and other forums for the next four hours? Four hours? You're in your little office away from the meeting? Oh my God. Every set of footsteps by my door sending me on a frenzy of window minimization. Four o'clock rolled by cars began to leave the parking lot. My phone had not rung. My Outlook inbox was still empty. At five o'clock, the lights went out in my office. I sat in complete darkness for five minutes, 10 minutes. OP is really trying not to get caught here. A half hour went by as I sat in a semi-daze alone in a dark office. Then it hit me. I was safe. I was forgotten. All was right with the world. I took out my cell phone and played a silent celebratory game of Snake. And there is more. There's a part three. There's more to this story. But man, like it just like this story makes me think of just how over bloated corporate America is. How many of us actually need to be working? Do we even need to be working at all for the world to keep running? Like how many workers could we fire and everything would be okay? It's like, uh, the, I, I don't know if this is actually true, but like like when Twitter was bought by Elon Musk, he's like, oh, we can fire 80% of the workers and it's still run. I don't know if that's true. I don't think it's true. But like, even if it's a, a fraction of that is right, like how bloated are American or just corporations in general? Probably hella. Let me know if like you know anything about corporate America. If anyone who knows anything about corporate America, is it as like bloated and 
bureaucratic as OP is making it seem. I, I don't really know because I haven't really worked many corporate jobs, but well, let's get into part three. I had been dreading this day. In the back of my mind, I knew it was coming. In all my years here, my anniversary date has held as a beacon of hope. The promise of yet another pay raise, yet another shining star in the corporate report card that would one day land me a corner office with a view. This year, however, I wish that it would never come. I was sure that my ninth anniversary at this corporate juggernaut would raise sufficient enough flags to bring the human resources ninjas swinging through my office windows, sending the old copies of Baseball Weekly and collected Mountain Dew bottles flying in a maelstrom of broken dreams as they hauled me off to some cubicle to start being a productive member of society. Because again, OP is thinking, I guess like every year you might get like a, is like a status report of like, hey, did you do a good job? And then maybe you get a raise. But if they do this, then they're going to be like, wait, so like, what have you been doing uh, that you deserve this raise. So let's get into it. The email was waiting for me as I came in late to work. The return address was a name that I did not recognize, but the all familiar HR printed in bold at the end of it sent a shiver up my spine. I opened it up and all at once, a feeling of relief, bewilderment, and hope overcame me. Wait, what could this, what could this be? There's no way this man's getting a raise for not doing a single bit of work for months and months and months. Quote, Moonshine Employ 412. Our records indicate that you are due for an annual performance review on September 10th. Please report to your designated departmental director, none on none, for your review. As you are a non-supervised managerial other employee, please submit a self-review detailing past accomplishments. Self-reviews must be submitted no later than September 13th to employee review at companyname.com. Best regards, HR Nazi. He gets to review himself? Is this like, this is like, like I don't know if you've ever written like a, a reference letter for yourself. Like one of you, I remember it like when I was in high school, I was like, oh, I asked one of my high school teachers, like, hey, can you write a reference letter for me? And he's like, yeah, yeah, just write it yourself and then I'll sign it. And I wrote the most glowing, like Samuel Donner is the best student I've had in my 20 years of teaching at Loyola High School. And I will never recover as he leaves my grade because there will never be anyone like him. Uh, still didn't get into Harvard though, but you know, if he's writing his own review, he's, 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 I think he's going to be good. He's still going to have to write about his accomplishments, but is anyone going to check up on that? I reread the letter twice, trying my hardest to figure out any hidden meanings. The good news was that from the form letter, it seemed as though they had no idea what I did. The bad news was neither did I. I had three days to find out some kind of good response and send it back in a very unthreatening fashion. I actually needed to do work and the clock was ticking. This feels like a like die hard, but instead of just like taking place in an office with like guns going about, it's just like taking place in an office and it's OP with Mountain Dews and Reddit open trying to figure out how to disable this ticking time bomb that's just an HR. So 20 minutes later, I'm sitting in the bar at Applebee's downing a cold Bud Light and pondering my situation. Solutions, including prolonged vacation, botched workplace injury, and phone call to HR to ask what I do were soon dismissed, and I had hit a dead end. I finished off another beer, and a thought suddenly hit me. Every two weeks, without fail, I had received a paycheck at my house. Although I had rarely opened them, I knew there was a section on there that listed a departmental code, a simple four-digit number that would hold the answer to what my company thought I did. I paid my bill and headed home, determining to wake up in the morning and figure out what I was going to do with myself. You're not going to figure it out before you get to bed. Unfortunately, when I got home and opened up an old paycheck, I realized my department code was listed as 0000, which I feared was the default code. I couldn't have been more wrong. I'm always left on these, these cliffhangers. I showed up at nine o'clock on September 11th, marking my first return to actual working hours 
in months. My first stop was to the accounting section of the building where I cornered a temp employee and asked real managerial like, what department does code 0000 refer to? She typed a few numbers into her computer and replied with something that blew me away. Workplace safety. I staggered back a bit, but tried to regain my composure quickly. How many employee entries are there in the workplace safety group? She typed two more entries and came back with Moonshine here in Detroit and James Alexander in the Fort Worth office. So Moonshine is OP. It was obvious she had no idea who I was, which was a bonus, but my heart sank for a minute as I realized there actually was somebody else in this company who was actually doing the non-job that I was somewhat tasked to do. I retreated to my office and tried to plan my next move. Workplace safety, I thought, trying to take the gist of what was said to me. Was it then my job to make sure nobody walked around on stilts or ran with scissors while on company property? Not that it was a huge epidemic around here, but I was somewhat freaked that the next time Lumpy make a bumper f and shipping and receiving decided to pour lie on his groin that I would be responsible. The only answer was to find James Alexander. Now it's going taken. It's like, I'm going to find you and understand what you do at this company and use it to apply to my very specific set of skills. I would pretend that I was an actual working safety inspector and try and pry him about what kind of work he did. I was able to track down the number to the Fort Worth office and gave him a call. James Alexander was the reply. Mr. Alexander, this is Moonshine, the Detroit safety inspector. I was wondering if you could help me with a couple of items that I've got going up here. There was a pregnant pause, then a quick hold on as I was put on hold. About 20 seconds passed by, then he came back on the line his voice down at a whisper. Who do you work for? I thought quickly, Greg McDonald, I lied. I've never heard of a Greg McDonald. And he told you to call me? Alexander asked, sounding somewhat worried. No, sir, I did it of my own volition. Yet another pause, then, are you really a workplace safety employee? I recognized something in his voice and decided to take a shot. Wait, I think I think I know what's happening. Put I see you in the comments if you if you if you see what's happening right here. I knew I was putting everything on the line, but it felt as though I was at a point regardless of whether or not I admitted my status to the stranger on the phone. I took a deep breath and answered a very confident no. Are you with HR? Was the stern reply. No. Then what do you do? Nothing. There was yet another pause and a flash of heat cascaded over my skin. There was a barely intelligible snort, almost laughter. Then he replied, me neither. They're kindred spirits. Wait, that means they can report to each other and no one ever has to know. This could, this could go on forever. It was like I had asked him if he had stairs in his house. Only the answer was 100 times more exciting. It turns out James Alexander of Fort Worth, Texas was an original workplace safety inspector and had been with the company for seven years. About three years ago, the department was dissolved and the responsibility for oversight was placed in the hands of our company's quality control department back down in Florida. He was furloughed for a period of five months. Then one day he received a letter asking him to return to work. When he returned to work, he was given temporary quarters in a recently abandoned office and was told he would be given new assignments shortly. Shortly turned in to two years. Two years, man, has been doing nothing. I was amazed that I was not the only one who was forgotten in this corporation. He told me that all he did was browse the internet and replace the contents of the first aid kit when they ran low. <laughs> he had never failed to receive a raise and was never once accosted by any higher ups. He and I postulated that the computer must have defaulted to a 0000 code when none was inputted for my company file. Luckily, here, 0000 wasn't just a code meaning nothing. It was actually still the defunct workplace safety group. He told me, count my blessings and hung up the phone with a sincere good luck. Okay, but then it still like begs the question, what do you do in this report? The next day, I showed up at work with a new purpose in life. What I had come across was even better than having no job. I now have a job 
with no responsibilities. I walked throughout the office looking at light sockets, chairs, and microwaves, exactly as I supposed that a safety inspector would do. Later that day, I would write my personal review, remembering to keep it vague and short so as not to rouse attention. James had informed me that most reviews would be automatically answered with a standard raise without ever crossing the desk of anybody except an HR secretary. How is this company still running that they're just giving everyone a raise no matter what? Just so long as you don't admit to doing anything extraordinarily good or bad. So I wrote, quote, Employ moonshine number 412. Accomplishments. Maintained a zero accident rate in the Detroit corporate and shipping offices for the entire 2002 calendar year. I guess this is from 2002. Damn, we went way back for this story. Responded to every safety issue in a timely fashion. This internal customer service was accomplished within the allotted budget. Heightened awareness for safety-related issues among employees. I hit send and waited for the possible downfall the next week. This past Wednesday, I showed up at work with a bottle of aspirin from 7-Eleven and a rubber carpet bumper that I picked up from a Home Depot. Back where the employees go out to smoke, the carpet at the door was horribly mangled and many an unhappy soul was sent crashing to the floor by a misplaced step on the hazard. So first thing I did was put the bumper down and glue it into place using some bullshit Billy Mays fabric crap glue that the Yahoo at the Home Depot said worked wonders. It wasn't pretty, but now there was no danger of tripping. I am responding to workplace safety issues, keeping under budget as the $9 came out of my pocket. I placed a sign on the wall next to the bumper seen below. I'm excited to read this sign. This also reminds me of like this story I heard a while ago where there was this company that invoiced Google for $100,000 a month and had to uh, go to jail for fraud. But I wonder if you would go to jail for fraud for this. Quote, Moonshine Employee 412, we are pleased to announce that your annual performance review has been deemed satisfactory. As a result, your pay rate has been increased by 5% retroactive to September 1st, 2002. Sincerely, HR Nazi. Now, a week has passed and nothing else has happened. I was asked to check a battery in a smoke detector by a secretary yesterday who had unfortunately seen me place the bumper in the back hallway. So yes, I now have to do some work. But until the camel spiders invade accounting and I've got fatalities on my hands, I will continue to sit here playing snake on my Nokia and browsing the something awful forums. I am Moonshine, the protector of Detroit corporate shipping and receiving, here to make sure nobody falls down on my watch. Woo! I mean, like, like he actually is getting a little bit of responsibilities, and I guess some people know him as the office safety manager, but that was some 40 chess. And also knowing that there's like another mole in the company that's doing nothing, that's kind of sick. I feel like you guys should work together to like figure this thing out. Uh, and maybe see if you can get even bigger raises. But there is a part four, and the first line is they're on to us. So I am very worried for our protagonist uh, that he might have to do some work, but let's get into it. Part four, they're on to us. Those four words, ambiguous in meaning, was what greeted me as I opened up my Microsoft Outlook one fateful Friday morning. My heart began racing as I realized the message had come from none other than James Alexander, my counterpart in Texas. Anybody being on to our scheme of hiding under the radar scopes was undoubtedly trouble, trouble that would manifest itself in the very next email that I opened. It's never a good sign when the name in the from field is followed by an identifier in brackets. And as I would learn, it was even worse when that identifier was recruiter. I double clicked on the message, plainly entitled question from nosy Mick in my business recruiter to moonshine subject question. Hi, moonshine. My name is nosy and I'm currently doing a budgetary survey of the Detroit operation. Unfortunately, some of the paperwork for you seems to be misplaced. I can't seem to place you anywhere on the company organizational chart. Might you stop by when you have a minute so that we can sort everything out? Oh, oh, dude, OP is about to be found out. I, I don't know how OP is going to get out of this one. This is, this is too much. A flush of heat swept over me, as well as a slight nervous jitter that would only be calmed 
by the massive ingestion of nicotine into my nervous body. With trembling hands, I lit up a cigarette right under my desk and sat back to ponder what my move was. A multitude of discovery scenarios had played out in my head in the months leading to this unexpected twist, but they all involved the temporary stream of bullshit that would spray from my mouth should somebody ever in passing ask what it was exactly that I did. Nothing had prepared me for a meeting. Therefore, I decided on the smartest possible thing to do, ignore it, like that lump on my ball. Yikes. I quickly deleted the email, logged on to the SA forums, and tried to clear my mind. It seemed to work for a few hours as I was lost in complete bliss. Then that goddamn box popped open. The temptation to click, no, I do not want to read this new email that has been sent to me by somebody that is most likely hell bent on my demise was overcome by curiosity. And my thumb subconsciously flecked the enter button to display what was surely another email from Miss Nosy. My worst nightmares were confirmed by the subject line re not read question that had read receipts enabled. Those also sneaky check marks that for years have exposed management to the sheer number of must read notices that go promptly into employees deleted items folder had once again surfaced to bite me in the pale white. The body of the message was even more ominous. I see that you are in. I will come down to your office to discuss. West side, first floor, correct? The irrational side of my brain begged me to supply her with fake directions. I rationalized the thought, believing that it would indeed buy me time, but realizing that it would only dig the hole deeper, I assessed my options for escape. And yes, tactically, my mind works as a cross between a BF 1942 and MS Paint. I was without sufficient weaponry to meet her head on, and she was coming towards me from one of my only two possible exit routes. The only other escape route was down the hallway and out to the car. Unfortunately, I was unaware of how much time I had left or if she was hanging outside my closed door right now. It seemed an awfully big risk to hightail it down that dark corridor, past the rows of unoccupied locked offices and off to freedom. It was going to be close. I needed to get to my door, down 60 feet from the hallway and out the side entrance before she rounded the corner. I knew that as a man, I needed to face adversity in my life. It was either do or die. This was a test of courage and manhood, and there was no backing out. I just had to shuffle quietly 30 feet down the hallway and off to freedom with a strong possibility of being caught in the act. It was truly a character defining moment as I stood with my hand trembling on the doorknob, not sure if the recruiter was standing on the other side. This was a defining moment. If this is a defining moment, OP, you got to you got to do more with your time than just play snake. So like a jittery little adolescent squirrel, I scrambled to the other side of my office and went right out the window. No qualms about it without even thinking twice. I slid the frosted paint up and climbed on through. Fortunately, I neglected my considerable body mass and fell directly on my as I slithered through the cold metal frame. Shaken, but safe, I crowd low to move away from my window, then glance around to make sure I hadn't been seen. Safe. In my secrecy, I walked around to the other end of the building and got in my truck. Tearing out of that parking lot at the speed of light, my only thought was to get as far away from that place as possible and deal with what may come on Monday morning. So six hours later, I'm at the bar stirring over a rapidly warming beer. I didn't have much taste for alcohol that afternoon. Afternoon! And pondering my problems. I had used the payphone to call my wife to let her know I would be home late, as I had forgotten my cell phone back in the office and needed to return for it. I had absolutely nothing in mind of how to counteract the situation. I had figured that perhaps I needed to start making phone calls to vice presidents down at the corporate offices, doing damage control and trying to rebuild what was left of my sidetrack career. I had resolved to do that on Saturday, but first I needed to get back to the office and get my cell phone. The parking lot was lit dimly by the Oh, so OP is OP has forgotten evidence. OP has forgotten his cell phone in the office. The parking lot was lit dimly by the orange glow of the low powered streetlights as I pulled back into the office building. I casually walked up to the front door, sliding my key card through and strolled into the office. I expected that nobody was there 
and walked with the calm determination that expectation brought. Oh, sh um, came a voice from my left. My heart leapt into my throat as I turned to look. Sitting there in the corner office was Paul, our vice president of marketing strategy, burning the midnight oil. It seemed with a bottle of Boone's Farm wine and an open jar of Vaseline <laughs> and a box of tissues sitting in plain view on his desk. His left hand worked fervently at the mouse button in a desperate attempt to close down whatever had previously graced his screen. His bald head grew red as he struggled to keep up with the pop-ups, a cascade of hot pink letters proclaiming hot teen by and a oriental kind of bitch leaving a virtual blood trail that betrayed his rapid attempts to conceal what he had been looking at. Bro, maybe it's bad that my mind first went here, but blackmail to get a raise. OP, do you have the secret sauce? The secret Vaseline covered sticky sauce to get what you need to get this raise? Mr. Moonshine, he started his voice cracking. I didn't think that anybody was still here. No problem, sir. I was just coming back into. No, I really didn't know. Honest, I um, I don't get AOL at home. Uh, this is really a long time ago. I was getting set to walk away, but I stopped looking over at a slightly overweight man, beads of sweat forming on his head. I'm sorry, I ask. I don't get that web thing at my house. I was just looking at pictures, you know, adult pictures. <laughs> oh, I bald man why are, you, why are you exposing yourself i nodded and averted my eyes but he continued it just sucks since my wife left me i looked back up incredulous that this man who up until today i had only met in passing was doing anything but closing his door and trying to forget the incident i'm sorry i repeated again and that's when the blubbering began i don't know what to do it's been six months i've never even dated before for god's sake look at me see you can tell I was married for 18 years. I have no idea what to do. I can't even cook noodles. Oh, hell, I have no idea what to do. I tried to do the whole single scene thing, but I'm a fish out of water if there ever was one. Uh, it takes some time. I tried to console him cautiously. He motioned me into his office, trying to force a smile. Against my better judgment, I walked in and sat down. You, you're a popular guy with the ladies, he asked. I raised my left hand in response, showing him the wedding ring. He nodded, then looked up to the ceiling as if searching for what to say. But you're used to the parting scene. You can do the whole hippie hop music stuff, right? I nodded slowly, unsure of where this was going. Hip hop, I corrected. He smiled as if I had just unlocked a great secret for him. I tried all that stuff. I've been to nightclubs. I'm just doing something wrong said the overweight, balding vice president who I had caught masturbating and drinking what most 14-year-olds would have grown out of right in his office. I want to be able to go out and talk to women. I want to go out and drink beers and dance and have casual relationships. Is that an unreasonable request? I guess not, I squirmed. Can you help me? My mind raced. I had no idea what he was asking me to do, but then suddenly... Something clicked in my head. I could turn this thing to my advantage. The stuff tonight, I started pointing at the computer. This is all our secret, right? He looked shocked. Oof, of course, why? I'll help you out, but you have to help me out. Have you ever heard of Nosy Mick in my business? Well, she's all over me. You know, I've been here for a while. You know, I'm a good employee. How about you just tell her that I'm on your budget in your department? That way, she'll just get off my case. He raised an eyebrow, smiling with the corner of his mouth. That may be possible. And if I do? If you do, I hope you get back on your feet as far as the social life. He reached his hand across the table and said, Dale. I looked down at his hand, then back up at him, grimacing mildly. He quickly withdrew it, replying, oh, yeah, right. Because he had just been freaking mad with that hand. Also, where is OP finding the time to write all this? But then I realized OP does nothing the whole day and probably has nothing but time to write this. I got up and walked out of the room, then looked back at him, and I smiled for a second. MILFHunter.com, sir. Username is XXX. Password is XXX. Knock yourself out. With that, I walked out his office and back into the world of feeling secure with my job. Come Monday morning, 
And on all the glorious mornings after, I never again heard another word from the recruiter. There's a little bit, but there's more. There's an epilogue. But wow, OP knows how to play the game. But let's get into this epilogue. So it was inevitable. I had been saved by a vice president who played with himself in his rich Corinthian leather chair at work. I had to hold up my end of the bargain. And I did. About two weeks after the episode that still haunts my dreams, I convinced the wife and a few of her work friends to join me and vice president midlife crisis at the bar. The night began poorly and went downhill from there. When we first walked in, I spotted him sitting at a corner booth tearing the label off a bottle of beer. We went over and sat down and he perked right up. He was a talkative little bastard. I ended up learning his entire life story, except when a female walked by, at which point he would clam up like a four-year-old boy. I knew that it would be a difficult situation, especially after two hours and about five more beers when he handed me a napkin and asked me to give it to the sugar bunny of a waitress. I nodded and stood up, looking down, at the wadded up paper. You are a very beautiful woman. What time do you get off work? Wave at me if interested. I don't know if that's cute, man. I resolved about two words into that note that I couldn't give it to anybody. So I walked to the waitress and pretended like I was talking to her at the crowded bar, which seemed to satisfy Paul. As I was doing this, my wife came up to me and gave me the equivalent of, we've got to go. So I had to think quickly. Hey, how does Sandy like Paul? I asked her. Sandy was a coworker of my wife, moderately attractive. If you like the beach blonde 80s pop star who got run over by tractor look, she eyed me curiously. Why? Have her come over here, I said. My wife waved her over to the bar and she stumbled half drunkenly towards us. I explained to her that Paul was really lonely and was looking for a friend to pay some attention to him for the night. This sounds like OP's setting up the boss with a hooker. I also mentioned that he was horribly rich in assumption and that he was a really fun guy to be around, a lie. She seemed disinterested at the beginning, but then she took a different approach. What's in it for me, she asked. What, like money, I replied. Nothing in my life had ever prepared me for pimping, so I was kind of rusty when thrown directly into the situation. I want one of your puppies. She stated matter-of-factly. I glanced at my wife, who shrugged. A week prior, our hound dog had a massive litter of pups, and we were having some trouble finding buyers for all of them. Now, Sandy was a nice woman with kids, but very poor, and I didn't see the harm. Pimping out your coworkers and paying them in puppies, that's a first. Um, okay. She smiled and pointed at me, her finger waving drunkenly in my face. Nothing. She stated, then proceeded to turn around, and walk towards our booth, sliding into the seat next to Paul. My wife and I ended up paying our tab, then sliding out of there for the evening, all the while wondering what the heck was going to happen. The suspense was with us all weekend until I returned to work the following Monday morning. The first message on my index was from Paul. It stated simply, your wife's friends has great hands. I sat back smiling, a puppy for a hand job, and the preservation of the American dream. All in all, a wonderful trade. And there's a part five. This thing keeps going. Part five. Part five. Hey, do you work here? What a loaded question, I thought with a pause. Now, technically, I work here, as in I get paid by this company in exchange for reading the forums and drinking Mountain Dew all day. At least that's what my brain has rationalized. I understand that it is really a buyer's market on people with my specific talents, i.e. laziness, and or caffeine addiction, so I better play it cool when questioned. I nodded yes to the man who had asked the question. Cool dog, he replied, whooping out a clipboard. I glanced around the dark parking lot, wondering why the f I had chosen this time in particular to come out for a quick cigarette. It was about 7.30 at night. I was the last person in the office, and I had thought it might be a good idea to sneak out for the last smoke in the cool night air before heading out. I normally don't stay past four or five, but today I was supposed to meet my wife for dinner at a restaurant near my office, so I figured might as well stay at work and fuck around on the forums until the time came. What do you need? I asked the man, pretending to be in a hurry. I'm not horribly happy dealing with, you know, random people in general, especially when they want something. I got this delivery here for you guys, he replied, thrusting the clipboard in my face. He gestured back towards his very old panel truck, idling next to the loading dock. 
Shipping and receiving is open until like five, man. I think you should come back tomorrow morning. Oh, come on, man. I'm already running late. He whined, pushing the clipboard further into my face. I scanned his clothing in the truck, yet was unable to figure out what company he may work for. There was, of course, the chance that he was a spy. I took one last rag of my cigarette and was about to reply when he cut me off. But it's Christmas, man. December 3rd. My kids don't know the difference, the man almost pleaded. At this point, I started to get a little uneasy about the situation. I just nodded slowly and took the clipboard. The man smiled and pointed to the line where I had to sign. And I accepted the delivery as Alexander G. Bell because I'm not dumb enough to put my name on anything when it comes to this company. In short order, I was presented with three boxes ranging from very large to very small. As the man pulled away, I looked at the address labels, which were hastily attached post-it notes with masking tape. They were intended for a coworker who had been released back in October over a theft scandal. I opened the door and started to kick the boxes inside, weighing my options. There was no return address, no shipping label, and no indication of whom the boxes were delivered by. Crazy, jittery guy driving a shit truck. Anthrax or diamonds, I was clueless as to the contents, but curiosity ended up getting me in the end, and I maneuvered all the boxes into my empty office. The thought of leaving these boxes outside the door of receiving crossed my mind, but they hardly seemed important and were intended for somebody who nobody had seen in months. I proceeded to tear into the largest of the three boxes, and nothing could prepare me for what lay within. Globes. Not just one globe, but four globes and a note, a cryptic note. Hope you have a globrious holiday. Yes, Whiskey Tango Foxtrot over four spherical representations of the planet Earth, all sitting on my office floor, accompanied by a note of questionable origin. I slowly moved over to the middle-sized box, wondering what the hell could possibly be inside. More globes, two to be exact, yet this time without a note. Now, I don't work in any industry that involves high school history teachers, cartographers, or maniacal dictators. The purpose of a gigantic plastic planet was lost on me, but I continued in my opening process. As I tore into the smallest box, I was greeted with yet another note. This one, a bit more lengthy. Figured you could use this stuff for a party. We haven't talked in a while. Make sure to message me, Candace. Inside the box were dozens of packets of seeds, wildflower seeds, and of course, combs, 14 ace combs. I stood up, backed slowly away from the loot, plopping down in my chair. A cold winter wind shook the plane of glass behind me as I stared blankly down at the assortment of party items on the floor. Globes, seeds, homes, party. I needed a drink. But first, I needed some kind of reassurance that I was still sane. Just the slightest comforting voice that said to me, hey, you're okay, man. It's the world that's f***ed up. I tried my wife on her cell phone, no luck. Without thinking, I dialed the number to my old office down south. Now, I don't really work anymore, but there was a time that I was a manager of a very large department at this company. For years, I hired, trained, molded, and sometimes fired dozens and dozens of people. Relationships were formed, relationships that carried on to this day. I still get emails and phone calls from some of my old employees asking for my advice on certain things. I knew that one of my dearest work friends was on the night shift that evening in my corporate office, so I dialed his direct line. Hey, I've got a bit of a problem I started. I've come into possession of a godly number of random items. Like what? My friend asked. Oh, like, um, globes. There was a bit of laughter on the other end of the phone, then a quick reply, probably from one of those management types. Everybody has a globe. This made me think. I closed my eyes and thought back to as many offices that I could remember in this company, and a startling revelation was had. Everybody had a globe. But I never realized it until the motherload of earthly scale modeling was dumped into my lap. I mean, really, how often do you notice a globe? When you see one, do you ever stop and wonder why it's there? A decoration of sorts or something more sinister? Hey, I've got a question for you. I was snapped back to reality by the change of subject. My friend went to a long situation about a problem that he was having with a certain aspect of his job, the job that is done by a department that I used to run. I listened intently, then suggested a course of action that, although somewhat against the norm, would alleviate the problem in a timely and orderly fashion. My friend thanked me and hung up, and I walked out the door, leaving the random items sitting on my floor of my office, vowing to deal with it at a later date. Five days later, there's only so much that you can do with a globe. 
I had come to find out. I had taken one of them out and placed it upon my desk, and I had been staring at it on and off for a day and a half. So far, the uses for the globe, as discovered by me through intense testing, were spin really fast, use your index finger to run across the equator, try to step only on land for added difficulty points, play president of the United States, spin the globe real fast, close your eyes, point to a place on the globe, repeat three times, declare the three indicated locations as your own personal access of evil, mine, Spain, Arizona, and the Indian Ocean. As I sat slack-jawed staring at the globe, something truly horrible happened. Something truly horrible. My door swung open and standing at the entrance to my office was a vice president. I knew this man well and had worked in close conjunction with him numerous times in my old position. I hadn't seen nor heard from him since my move to the remote satellite location in Detroit. I had no idea he was even in the state, let alone the office this morning. I was unaware there was an all-employee management meeting in town. I nearly froze in fear as my right hand subconsciously scrambled for the mouse, minimizing everything on my computer screen. Mr. Moonshine, he began. How's it going? Long time no see. Very well, sir, I managed to form the reply. My eyes darted left to right, searching for anything incriminating in my office. Aside from the OSHA posters from wall to wall, a big pile of seeds, combs, and globes in the corner, everything looked almost professional. I've got a problem, he began. I gestured towards a chair across from my desk, snapping back as quickly as possible into whatever management mode I had still encoded in my brain. Well, it's everybody's problem. I think you know who I'm referring to. I shook my head. Mr. Dip, he continued, and I nodded. Mr. Dip is technically my old boss when I worked at the corporate office, but he was the epitome of everything that you would not want in an executive position. He was clueless as to the specifics of the job, poorly groomed, racist, a liar, and a crook who took personal vendettas to the next level. He also despised me from the start as I was constantly making him look bad because of my longevity at the company. I was friends with quite a few people in senior management, and this always frightened him. Instead of coming to him, most would go behind his back and come to me. So he had been gunning for me the entire time that we worked together. However, given my current situation, I figured that he had all but forgotten about me. I was quite wrong, though. Mr. Dip calls me yesterday and says that you're going behind his back and trying to purposely sabotage his operation. I blinked slightly and said, he said, what? Mr. VP smiled and continued, oh, yeah, he's up in a roar. He swears that you're sitting here running the company from your desk. What? Running the <laughs> man hasn't done anything in years. I attempted to stifle a giggle. Mr. VP, who hates Mr. Dip as much as the next guy, nodded and said, and I told him that I almost guarantee that you run his department from your desk. I've talked to some of his people down there, and they all insist that you're always there to help them out, whereas most of the time they can never find him. I sensed that the conversation might be taking a bad turn. So I tried to turn it back. I never try to run anything. If people need help, I give that assistance. But we're all on the same team, sir. But if Mr. Dip feels like I'm encroaching, I'll back off and let it be. Mr. VP raised his hand and shook his head. No, no. I want to make sure that things are run right. I know that you're horribly busy up here, but I want to make sure that you're available for consultation if need be. I nodded, pretending that in addition to my tremendous workload of posting on the Reddit forums, I would sacrifice and answer a couple emails a day. But then I asked, what about Mr. Dip? Don't worry about Mr. Dip, VP replied, snickering. He's got a hard on for you, Moonshine, in more ways than one. I tried not to show any emotion as my brain tried to rationalize that statement. He couldn't have meant what I thought he meant, right? Like, I mean, there's no way that troll-like human who's never been introduced to a Q-tip or nose hair trimmer could be, no, 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 cleanse my thoughts. <laughs> I replied, my worried eyes betraying my true feelings. I knew I could count on you, Moonshine, Mr. VP said as he stood up and walked towards the door. He stopped for a second, looking back at me. What's your title? I snapped back to reality as soon as possible and tried the soft answer. Still a manager. VP nodded, then pointed at my desk. I'll make sure you get the management globe, he promised, then walked out the door.
The management globe. Does this mean OP is moving up in the company after doing nothing for years? I think it might. I think it might. But there is the epilogue. We're going to get the conclusion to this story. Man, I hope you guys like this massive long one. Yeah, you did. Okay, epilogue. My globe with the executive wooden stand appeared a few days later and now occupies a place of honor in my small office. Every once in a while when I leave my door open, people walk by and glance in and although nearly imperceptible, I can tell their posture straightens up a bit when their eye comes across that piece of furniture. That simple object which says to the world, I am a monster of the corporate world. Within 20 seconds, I can tell you the capital of Madagascar. Now fetch me some coffee. The six original globes still sit stacked up beside my bookcase. What to do with them remains a mystery. I'm absolutely positive that one is earmarked for my Reddit secret Santa, but as for the other five, perhaps I'll just leave them on random people's desks at work. If the secretary in accounting seems to be having a bad day, she may just come in the next day to a bright, shiny blue ball of plastic sitting on her desk. And maybe, just maybe, that will be the motivation needed for her to continue striving in this corporate jungle. The seeds and combs have all been distributed by random sampling in the spirit of the season. I went through our Microsoft Outlook address book and picked the random names of employees all across America and sent them manila envelopes filled with either seeds or combs or a combination thereof. No return address, just little notes like Merry Christmas, here's a comb, and seeds and greetings. <laughs> The poor man's Chris Kingrel, I surely am. Spreading wildflowers and well-groomed hair company-wide. The phone rang bright and early this Monday morning. I finished the paragraph that I was reading on ESPN.com and went for the phone. Mr. Moonshine, came the voice from the cell phone. Mr. Vice President, I replied. Just checking up on you. Anything negative from Mr. Dip? Now, I had received a grand total of one email since the last conversation and had solved that minor problem in a grand total of five minutes, but he didn't have to know that. Well, there's a lot of stuff, but I'm keeping it in line, sir. Very good. Continue running the company, Moonshine, he said with a laugh. Will do, I replied and hung up the phone. I thought for a second, looked down at my cell phone and proceeded to run the company in the most productive fashion that I could think of. I beat my high score in snake. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the end of the saga of the forgotten employee. What a crazy, what a crazy journey we've been on. Um, I also am like very curious for people in corporate jobs. Like, have you ever, at least for like a beautiful week or a beautiful month, had like nothing to do because you were forgotten about? Um, I would love to know from anyone who's like in the corporate world, does this stuff happen? Because I've heard about like stories about this happening. Like there's a Silicon Valley episode about it where like Google employees are just continually paid, but don't have to do anything and are just forgotten by the system. And it's awesome. But I would love to know if you guys have any experiences with that yourself or know someone who has put your answers in the comments. Hopefully you enjoyed this long hard solo episode we're gonna be trying this out a little bit more and with that i will see you in the next episode i love you guys uh thank you for you know watching if you've gotten all the way to the end if you've gotten all the way to the end send me a a, a two two line poem and i'll read it and say sam's two line poem all right i'll see you soon <laughs>